If you've got your Bibles with you, please can you turn with me to Luke's Gospel, Gospel of Luke, in chapter 20. For those of you who are using the church's Bibles, they're the Bibles that are in front of you, behind you, underneath you. You should find it on page 1055. So it's Gospel of Luke, chapter 20, and reading the first 19 verses. Luke 20, verse 1. One day, as he was teaching the people in the temple courts and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Tell us, by what authority you are doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? He replied, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven? or from men. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us because they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered him, we don't know where it was from. Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the the tenants so that they would give to him some fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. The owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, May this never be. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written, The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but the one on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the people. Amen. Now, just before we turn to the passage that Mix just read to us, can I ask you to turn to Isaiah chapter 5, please? Isaiah chapter 5. And I'd invite you to look for the link between this passage and the one just read to us. Uh, It's a song of the vineyard, it's called. Um, Isaiah chapter 5. I'm just going to read the first seven verses. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up cleared it of stones, and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I've done for it? When I looked for good grapes... Why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I'll take away its hedge, it will be destroyed. I'll break down its wall, it'll be trampled. I'll make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated. Briars and thorns will grow there. I'll command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, 
but saw bloodshed. For righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for its relevance to us today. Thank you that it's your inspired gift to us. We actually hear what you are saying, what you are speaking and want to say to us. And so that is our prayer again this morning, that you would speak to us and open our eyes to see who Jesus is. Maybe in a new and a deeper way than we've ever done before. That he, Jesus, might be glorified by this time spent in his word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you'd like to turn back now to Luke chapter 20. This is the last in my series of the parables from Luke's Gospel. We've been working our way through the story parables of Luke. In other words, those which have a a definite plot line. So we're into the last days of Jesus' ministry. He's arrived in Jerusalem. The cross is very, very close. For the moment, he still enjoys the favour of the people. But the hatred of the spiritual leadership has come to its boiling point. The parable is called the parable of the tenants. It's about a vineyard rented out to some tenants who turn out to be scoundrels. When the owner sends for fruit, the tenants beat up his servants. And when the owner sends his son, they plot to kill him And they do. But the final word is with the owner who justly judges them, killing them and giving the vineyard to others. Now what is that all about? Well, you'll see in verse 19 that the spiritual leadership of the day clocked it immediately. They knew he had spoken this parable against them. For starters, they knew Isaiah 5, the song of the vineyard, which is recalled by Jesus in his parable. There's a lovingly prepared vineyard, planted with choicest vines. And when a crop of good grapes was looked for, all it yielded was bad fruit. And so it was judged. Isaiah 5 verse 7 said, The vineyard belongs to the Lord Almighty. And the vineyard is the house of Israel and Judah, God's chosen people. And back then, the fruit of their lives was thoroughly bad. No justice, but bloodshed. No righteousness, no doing what's right, just cries of distress. And so judgment must come, and it did. These spiritual leaders knew Isaiah 5, but they also knew their own hearts. Just look at chapter 19, verse 47, to see what was in their hearts. 19, verse 47, the chief priests, teachers of the law, leaders among the people, were trying to kill him. Once again, it's not justice, but bloodshed. It wasn't difficult for them to see that they were the tenants of the parable, that Jesus was the son sent by his father, the owner, to bring him back fruit. He's looking for good fruit in his people and in them as the spiritual leaders who in particular have spiritual responsibility for those people. But he doesn't find it, this fruit. They were the ones who would kill Jesus the Son. Now these leaders have a real problem with the authority of Jesus Christ. They dispute it and they challenge it. Look at verse 2 of chapter 20. Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? 
Who gave you this authority? Who do you think you are? Now, Jesus doesn't answer their question directly, but he does by telling the parable. And in the parable, we'll see that Jesus claims absolute authority as God's son. He's been sent to them with all the authority of the Father, who's called the Lord Almighty in Isaiah 5. And he's sent to bring back fruit for his father. What will these spiritual leaders do with this claim of Jesus that he has absolute authority as God's son? And in the parable too, we must hear his claim, the claim of Jesus to absolute authority over our lives as God's son. And what will we do? Will we respect him or will we reject him? So first of all, Jesus claims absolute authority as God's son. So where do we see that in the parable? Well, verse 13, where Jesus deliberately uses this phrase, my son whom I love. Now, those were the very words that were heard as a voice from heaven on the occasion of Jesus' baptism. And all those who were present at Jesus' baptism heard the voice of God the Father concerning Jesus say these words, You are my son. And I've always found that strange. So to understand what my son is all about, that it is a declaration of Jesus' absolute authority, we need to understand how the Old Testament uses the phrase, God's Son, the Son of God. And it uses it as a title. Jesus as God's Son not only speaks of a relationship with his Father, but it's a title that endues him with all authority. The authority of God, no less. Now, there is a similarity in thinking of our Queen and Charles. The Queen's son is Charles in a mother-son relationship. But Charles is more than that. As Queen's son, he is Prince Charles, Prince of Wales, that's his title, and he will be king over us with all that authority. The Old Testament speaks of the king over God's people, people like Saul, David, Solomon, as God's son. Interesting. It was his title. He ruled over God's people on God's behalf. But kingship back then had a second meaning too, and we met it when the people first asked for a king. Remember that? They said to Samuel, we want a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. So Israel's king was also to be the one to save them from their enemies. So within the Old Testament Son of God title, the king was both the one to reign over them and the one to save them. I'd like you to turn to Psalm 2. Psalm 2 looks forward to a king who's called God's son. He's going to rule over the nations. He owns the whole earth. But he does have enemies whom he'll judge decisively, but also he saves from his wrath, any who will take refuge in him. So Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2, meet the plotters, those who conspire, the enemies, who gather against the Lord and his anointed one, that's his king. And what folly it is in verse 6, the Lord says to them, I've installed my king. And the king, by the words of verse 7, is the son. The son. 
I have installed my king by the words of verse 7, you are my son. Now just look at the authority of God's son there, verses 8 and 9. Everything is his. And it is for him to judge all. So in verse 12, kiss the son, embrace God's almighty king, or face his wrath. Take refuge in him, let him save you. Respect him, don't reject him. So back to Luke 20. I will send my son, says the owner of the vineyard, whom I love. I will send my king with all authority to rule over you and to save you. And this king is declared to be Jesus by that voice from heaven at his baptism. Jesus is the fulfilment of the Psalm 2 son or king. And just look at his authority. The authority of Jesus, ruler of the nations, the whole earth, judge of his enemies, saviour of his people who take refuge in him. That is the claim that Jesus is making in the parable. It's massive. You ask me, by what authority do I do these things? That authority. Of God's son, God's king. That is the claim he put before these leaders and the parable puts that claim before you and me too today. As God's king, Jesus claims he has absolute authority to be ruler of our lives. That we should call him Lord and live under his lordship. And as God's king, he claims his absolute authority to save us from the judgment that we would have to take refuge in him to avoid. And we can call him saviour. He has got the authority to say to you, to me, you are saved. He's got that authority to do it. That's wonderful. So via this parable, the leaders have their question answered, well and truly answered. Who gave you this authority? But they're given more than they're bargained for. Because the answer to the question has implications. What are you going to do with this outrageous claim of Jesus Christ, that he is God's son, to rule you and to save you. He's the, the authority to do both of those things. Perhaps, says the parable, they will respect him. Or they will reject him in the most awful of ways by throwing him out and killing him. And what will we do? Jesus has absolute authority to reign over our lives, to save us from his wrath, and we can either respect God's Son or reject God's Son. And there is consequence to respect and reject. Respect of God's Son will bring fruit. Respect of God's Son will bring fruit. In verse 10, it's fruit that the owner of the vineyard seeks. So he first sends his servants and lastly his son to bring him fruit from his vineyard. Servants like Isaiah. In the lives of his people, he's looking for fruit like justice, like righteousness. But he finds their hearts full of the bad stuff, even bloodshed. So the servants of this parable are the prophets that the Lord has sent to his people time and time and time again to warn them that unless they turn from their sinful ways, it has to be judgment. And time and time again, there is no fruit. 
because God's people are living no differently from anyone else. You wouldn't know they were God's people. John the Baptist, the last of the prophets, calls for repentance. The fruit of repentance, he says, in changed lives. And they behead him. So God sends his son, his king, whom he loves, to deal with the issue of the sin in the human heart once and for all, that he may have his fruit. Sin's penalty has got to be paid for. It has to be defeated for us. Then we can bear fruit. When anyone believes that through the death and resurrection of Jesus, their sin is dealt with, they respect God's Son as their Saviour. They take refuge in him. They believe he has the power and the authority to save them. Then the respect bears fruit. Not only a saved life, but a life lived with Jesus as Lord. They acknowledge the claim of Jesus to have every right over their lives. And so the fruit of the Holy Spirit begins to grow. God dwelling in our hearts as we let him have his way. Life is no longer what I say goes, but what he says goes. It's no longer what I want to do, but what he wants me to do. It's like being under new ownership, new management. Life is now Jesus' Lord in the home life, in the work life, in the church life, in the leisure time. All that I am is his. How does Jesus say that we can live like this? Well, it's easier said than done. But let me show you where it's said. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. How does Jesus say we can live with him as Lord? Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Jesus says he is truly Lord of the Christian, who in verse 47 of that chapter hears my words and puts them into practice. James chapter 1, 21, 22 puts it like this, humbly accept the word planted in you. Don't merely listen to the word, but do what it says. So respect for God's Son as Lord is a lifetime of listening and doing the words of Jesus. And that obedience brings great fruit. It yields the fruit that God's looking for in his people. To respect God's son, God's king, is to respect him as both saviour and lord. And the result will be that we shall be part of the fruit that Jesus brings to the Father. We shall be part of the fruit that Jesus brings to the Father. The fruit of saved lives lived with Jesus as Lord. That's the fruit he's looking for. The fruit of respect for the Son. Perhaps, the parable says, they will respect my Son. But verse 14 begins with but. The storyline of the parable now moves to warn about rejection of the Son. Rejection of God's Son will bring judgment. So just as surely as respect brings fruit, so rejection of God's Son as having any authority as Saviour and Lord brings judgment. In verse 14, the tenants plot to kill the heir. 
their rejection of him is total. They threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. So Jesus goes on to teach and to warn about the judgment that falls on all who reject him as God's saviour and Lord, God's son. And first of all, the judgment is just. And that positively screams at us from the parable. The comeuppance that gets meted out to the tenants, we would wholeheartedly agree with. It's right, it's fair, it's a justice, and we want to see it happen. Those wicked, murdering tenants, they get what they deserve. The judgment is just. What more could God have done for us than give his son to die, to take the wrath against our sin himself? And if we will then reject the one who's been sent to save us from sin, then our sin remains and it condemns us. But our rejection is our fault. God couldn't have done any more than give his son to intercept. The judgment is just. But then Jesus warns that the judgment is certain in verse 16. He will come and kill those tenants, give the vineyard to others. And you'll notice the word will twice in verse 18 as well. Will be broken, will be crushed. And Jesus here puts pay to a very common thinking of these days that reasons like this. A God of love will never judge. He could never do such a thing. We'll all be okay in the end. May this never be. They're ripe when they call God a God of love, but he is also God of justice. And as we've just seen, that's a justice that we wanted. It is because he is just that he will judge. So the judgment is just. The judgment is certain. And then thirdly, the judgment is final and frightful. We can't get away with it from this in the parable, Jesus follows up the parable with verses 17 and 18. The imagery turns to a stone and rejection of a stone. The imagery is Old Testament prophecy literally about to be fulfilled. To the horrified people who say, may this never be, Jesus looks straight at them and replies, you know, the words of Psalm 118 are literally days away from their fulfilment. He's the stone that the builders, Israel's leaders, are now rejecting. And yet I want you to see this in verse 18, that it's not only judgment for those leaders of the day. Look at how verse 18 begins. It's striking. It is everyone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. And we are included in the everyone of Jesus here. For everyone who rejects the authority of Jesus as God's Son, his Saviour and Lord, the prospect is going to be scary indeed. That word capstone in verse 17 can also be translated cornerstone and it seems that verse 18 covers both options. As for the cornerstone, that's a foundation stone, that can be tripped up on. You can fall on that stone and so it is that if we trip up on the question of the authority of Jesus as God's son by rejecting him, 
a saviour and lord it's broken to pieces for us as for the capstone that's the top coping stone of a usually a high building to reject Jesus as God's Saviour and Lord will be to be crushed under a falling capstone because we're stood in the wrong place at the wrong time. So Jesus warns here of the consequence of rejecting the authority as God's Son of Jesus Christ. He is Saviour, He is Lord. It's a just, it's a certain, it's a frightful judgment. And so in this final parable, it's a kind of last chance saloon for his hearers. He puts before them his claim of absolute authority as God's son, God's king, to save them and be lord of their lives. The question is, will they? And will we respect God's Son or reject God's Son? Let none of us who are listening here today or online perhaps reject by hardening our hearts like the chief priests and teachers of the law did that day. Let none of us say, Jesus, you have no authority in my life. I'll do it my way. Effectively, that is to say, as the tenants did, let's kill him. But rather, the words of Psalm 2, let us kiss the Son. Let us embrace him as our Saviour and Lord and take refuge in him from that coming judgment. That's respect. The respect of a saved life with Jesus as Lord brings fruit. But to reject brings judgment. Is that a bit harsh of Jesus to finish his parables like that? Or is it the extraordinary love of Jesus, warning us right up to his very last days, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. It's that extraordinary love that took him to the cross to bear the wrath of God against your sin and mine, that we might never bear that wrath ourselves. So Jesus Christ has absolute authority as God's Son, God's King, to save us and to rule over us. The question of the parable is, will we respect him, God's Son, or will we reject God's Son? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word does indeed declare that you are not willing that any should perish. And had you not sent your son to our rescue, we would all perish in the judgment that must fairly come against sin. So how we thank you that you so loved the world that you gave your son And whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. May all of our hearts listening today, our minds, be expanded to see better the absolute authority of Jesus Christ and respect him as Lord of our lives. Amen.